Um, good morning and thank you very much for being here and thanks to the organizers for, for inviting me. I must start off by saying that, you know, actually, like Copano was saying, I also feel very nervous being here. I mean, who in his right senses is going to sit in a room full of psychologists? <laughs> <laughs> you know. But um, yes, since I I am coming from a place of ignorance to talk to people who know, I feel fairly confident that um, the questions I'm, I'm about to raise will will um, help in creating um, proper reflections on, on the discipline of psychology and the move towards a decolonial African-centered feminist psychology. So thank you for being here. Now, when I first said I had to talk for 15 minutes, I, was, I panicked. But now I actually think that I have more time than I need. <laughs> so let me begin by, by, by saying what kind of structure I'm going to adopt here. I want to frame my talk here around the publication history of a certain South African novel, Bessie Heads, A Question of Power. Because this novel is about you know, mental illness, schizophrenia, and its publication history relates, I think, directly to the concerns that we have here today. And I would then want to use this as a springboard to think about the relationship between Africa in general and the disciplines of the social sciences, specifically psychology. Um, it's quite true that Copano, every time he sees me or corners me or meets me in a restaurant, says, why don't you do African psychology <laughs> in the Center for African Studies? And then finally, actually at that point, I want to make a very important distinction, which I think would inform the things we'll do later. Normally, when I talk to our students, I, I, I ask them to think of the disciplines of the social sciences as disciplines of modernity. And when I speak about disciplines of modernity, I speak about all of this sociology, politics, psychology, and so on. And that, in a sense, African studies started as a discipline of the non-modern. You know, in those days, non-modern societies were referred to as primitive, savage, and so on. So if you, I, I, I ask them to think about the disciplines of modernity, their structuring, their methods, their protocols of inquiry, and how you deploy those protocols and methods in societies that were explicitly, at that point, said to be non-modern. Remember at this point, we didn't have these ideas of different modernities and so on. And I then conclude with a reflection how the study of the non-modern in that sense, to use those same terms again, can infuse some new life into um, the disciplines of modernity. So let me begin with um, Bessie Head's A Question of Power. <clears throat> Now, by the time Bessie Head sent her novel manuscript, um, A Question of Power, to publishers, she had already published two novels, When Rain Clouds Gather, Maru, and had received you know, good reviews in, in the Euro-American press. So she was already a well-known writer, okay, fairly well-known writer, when she sent the manuscript of her new novel out. And so the thing was that several publishers rejected this manuscript. Let me just say that this is not unusual that manuscripts are rejected or that authors get rejection slips. And you know, authors, I suppose, are fairly well used to this. But what was interesting here in this tale of rejection was that this novel was, was already fairly well known. And the subject of the novel which is an artist's descent into madness, was a theme that modern literature, modern artists were obsessively concerned with. Anyone who as much as wrote a novel that 
explored the interiority of an artist and what process of artistic creation and alienation and so on and so forth that led, you know, the usual vocabulary of psychology and, and, and psychological crisis. So this fascination with art and madness, relationship between art and insanity, did not extend to Bessie Head. And the question was, why not? Now, when I was discussing this publication history with um, um, one of the longest editors of the African Heinemann African Writers series, because they finally accepted it and published it, there was this unsaid understanding between the two of us that, you know, normally um, publishers would jump at a book like this and sell it as, 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 as you know, this is a novel that deals with the modern crisis, uh, the crisis of the psyche, of the individual, and so on and so forth, and this individual being an artist. You see, artists are not supposed to have, you know, um, smooth psychological lives. It's that entanglement, that, that, that thing that makes, you know, um, um, that was what um, li the literary establishment was really fascinated with this. So, and, you know, as I said, what was unsaid between James Curry and I was that, you know, the idea you know, the New York, London publishers just couldn't, they didn't have the instruments to think through the idea of this black woman in rural Botswana suffering from alienation, mental crisis. It wasn't, it didn't fit the vocabulary of description of modern mental illness. What about other flaws? I mean, novelists, novels, manuscripts are accepted all the time and, and writers rewrite them. You know, people spoke about the difficulty and so on and so forth. But schizophrenia is difficult, right? So what was there was that Bessie Head, if she had lived in, say, New York, right? If she had lived in London and written a story about an artist descending into mad madness, it would have fitted the categories of psychological description. A modern subject, alienation, psychological crisis, and so on. But the traditional wisdom, conventional wisdom, about non-modern subjects was that they were communal subjects. You know, they lived their lives out fairly well plotted out, you know. Um, they're subjects of tradition. You know, they don't suffer mental, you know, they, they, they're born, they have naming ceremonies, they get married, they do, they do the jobs that their fathers had done, found, you know, whatever they do, and obey the chief, blend into a big family structure, live their lives, get, die, and are buried. You know, this, this, this is a pre-plotted life that does not have industrial alienation, bureaucratic, all of the things that started taking over in the formation of the disciplines of the social sciences, rationalization, individuality, interiority, agency, and choice, and so on and so forth. So the idea that someone in rural Botswana could be a good subject for this did not strike them until the African Heinemann uh, Af the Heinemann African Writers Series took this. Now, the point I'm trying to the the, the 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 point I'm trying to make by telling this story is that very often the categories of the disciplines of the modern take over our thinking in specific ways that we do not recognize, so that even when an opportunity opens itself for rethinking these kinds of things we shut that opportunity immediately. Because if it were possible to think of Bessie Head, you know, um, the story is partly based on her life, the novel is based on her life. If it was possible to think of Bessie Head in rural Botswana 
suffering all of the things that psychologists say leads to these kinds of crises and madness at that level. What would happen is that all of these categories will, will scramble. They will no longer be as valid. For example, the idea of an autonomous subject making decisions, rational, agentive, rather than blending into tradition, or an agent as an agent acting in the world that possesses a certain kind of interiority in the sense that you think about things, arrive at decisions, some which may be wrong, and others which may be correct, that you suffer the same kinds of fantasies and desires that modern subjects experience. If you handed that to Bessie Head, the rural subject in Botswana, what it means is that your whole apparatus, the tools for thinking through mental illness, will no longer be available to you, at least not in the same manner it was before. So, but keeping in mind this story, I want to reflect on the relationship between Africa and the disciplines. As I've said, if you bear in mind the fact that the disciplines assume, of the social sciences line, assume a certain kind of subject, a certain kind of society. And in fact, in the period by mid 19th century, to roughly about the First World War, when the disciplinary infrastructure of the modern university, as we know it, was being consolidated, Africa was not present, right? You know, you didn't think of African politics or African psychology or African sociology. In fact, um, one of my colleagues, just to digress a bit, um, one of my colleagues in the Center for African Studies, Lungsile Speso, wasn't the sociology department doing rural sociology? You know, the very contradiction, I'm sure for a long time, you know, he would have sat in that office of his while everybody was thinking of industrial workers, urban. A lot of people must have felt, oh, no, this guy should be in anthropology. Because the very idea of a rural sociology, you know, I mean, how do you give questionnaires to illiterate people, right? The, you know, the, the methods of dealing with non-modern subjects and modern subjects are significantly different. But he stuck it out and later found himself in African studies. So African studies, in a sense, was absent at this moment of the formation of disciplines. And these disciplines, as many people have argued, arose from this fragmented understanding of the world and fragmented self-understanding of the bourgeois subject. So at one level, there is that fragmentation of reality into disciplinary nodes and disciplinary methods. But more importantly, as Foucault and others have argued, actually the disciplines, the formation of the disciplines were driven by the needs and interests of the state. And although that has not been as explored as it should be, why try to foreground this? Of course, we know the, the word statistics, right? Perhaps that's the only one that, that's the only discipline that tells you, oh, no, no, this is what the state needs, even in its very title. So if knowledge production, disciplinary knowledge production as we know it today was driven by the interests and needs of the state, how can we think of knowledge production that is driven not by the needs and desires and interests of the state, but by the needs and desires and interests of those whom, you know, have been epistemologically disenfranchised, right? Africans, non-modern subjects, as, you know, to use again those, that, that same term, 
um, Africans, women, disabled people, minorities, and so on and so forth. Those, it wasn't just Africa that fell out in the process of erecting this disciplinary architecture, a whole lot of other groups, other interests fell out. And when we speak about decolonization and decoloniality, uh, people often say that, look, this is a trendy term, it's confusing, it means too many things. You know, the truth of the matter is that it simply means putting the needs and interests of the epistemologically disenfranchised at the <coughs> forefront of knowledge production. Simple. Because if we think of what has happened, and if, as people have argued, the interests of the state and the interests, needs of the bourgeoisie and its self-understanding of the world have been at the center of knowledge production, what if you change that? And once you begin to do that, what you find is that you're slipping into a disciplinary void. And the place of the disciplinary void is a place where you begin to rethink why it is that the questions and the, that you are answering are the questions privileged in the, same, in the first instance. Why are certain subjects researchable and others are not? Why is this happening in this manner? And in that disciplinary void, one of the lessons you learn is that it is possible actually to center the questions that concern you and let them drive your research and drive your methods and drive your concept formation. Because two things that African scholars very quickly learned with the admission into the academy post-Second World War, post-independence, is that the conceptual frames that they had inherited from the disciplines did not exactly fit. So at every point of conceptual deficit, they found themselves struggling. Either you have to struggle to fit it in, or you have to say to yourself, no, this thing doesn't quite fit, so what are we going to do with it? And sometimes this is the point at which new concepts develop, new ideas of how publics are constituted, new ideas of citizenship and post-colonial citizenship, new ideas of how to deal with the mind. And once those new ideas begin to arise, what it helps you do is to avoid the fragmentation that brought about that came about in the formation of the disciplines. And I suppose these days, people speak about transdisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, and so on. But very often what you find is that this is not a scrambling of the disciplinary infrastructure so much as an attempt to expand it. And attempts to expand disciplinary structures sometimes work, sometimes reinforce those disciplines themselves. There was a book that was published a couple of years ago. As so often happens, it came out of a crisis in the humanities in the United States. It was a book by, co-edited by Mbembe Bates and a couple of others. It was called Africa and the Disciplines. And the question they said themselves was, if, for example, your dean says, look, we have to retrench people, we have to cut jobs, give us a reason why we should not cut your jobs. And the whole book is filled with these really magnificent essays about what history has contributed, what the study of African history has contributed to the discipline of history, what 
you know, the study of Africa has contributed to the various disciplines in the social sciences. Now, the first time I read that book, because I also had taught it, I was curious that if the question, that this question arose at all, was again arising out of the needs of institutions that did not, in fact, value the study of Africa. And in privileging that question, you're contributing to re-entrenching those disciplinary structures. Even though the book speaks about, all of the essays speak about the ways in which the study of Africa has expanded disciplinary knowledge. As I've often said, if you teach Napoleon, it's not a big thing to say, okay, we're going to include Shaka. Because you're using the same methods. You're working with the same kinds of protocols. The more difficult thing, to my mind, is to allow the questions to drive your protocols of inquiry. And I'm, what I have found that African studies, or the study of Africa, can and has contributed to this, is that when the questions drive your research, very often you get to that cul-de-sac. And once you get to that cul-de-sac, that is the point of new invention. Because at that cul-de-sac, you suddenly realize that, as a friend of mine used to say, that economics is too important a subject to leave to economists. <laughs> you know, we've, we've got, yeah, we've got to, that, because you see, it, it's, it's too important just to allow these people to do models and get away with it. And, and you see, once you get to the point where those models fail, especially, again, in societies like ours, what then happens is that you have to jump through hoops, you know, to pretend to be staying within the discipline or to accept the fact that the discipline itself has not helped in the answering of this question and you have to reach out beyond it. And the reaching out, it's often, you know, um, the study of Africa started as one discipline within anthropology, or what was called area studies. So if you studied economics, if you studied marriage, if you studied exchange systems, if you studied political structure, you were studying all of them as one whole, you know. Um, this was sanctioned by the anthropological method and area studies methods of inquiry, which have been largely discredited. But one of the, I think, maybe a beneficial legacy of that is to transcend this fragmentation that does not allow for moving beyond a certain kind of methodological fundamentalism that defines how you cope with your disciplines. So let me conclude by just saying that since I do not know much about um, psychology myself, you know, um, I would again tell a story and several stories about, you know, if you like, different kinds of subjects who have encountered psychology and the way it's practiced, and thought, my God, this is absolute bunker. I'll start, of course, you know, I'm sure everyone is aware of Fanon's um, own writing, so I don't need to go into that. But a whole lot of subjects, um, African-American activists in the late stages of black power, I can think of Eldridge Cleaver, Jackson, and several others. In the memoirs they wrote, every one of them talks about going to see this analyst, you know, from prison. And, and every time, for some reason, the analyst came back with this um, diagnosis that either you hated your mother or you loved your father or you hated, and, and, and these people in jail for 
you know, shooting people in Auckland, you know. All that you can say to them is that they hate their mothers or they hate their fathers or they love their mothers. <laughs> and they couldn't, you know, quite get a handle in the tools they had for thinking about these subjects were wholly inadequate to what they were doing. And it is time, in fact, in a project like this, to rethink those tools, as Shosha said at the very beginning. Thank you.